Christmas is a time of joy, a time of giving. At least, that's what everyone expects. In Hamilton, Ontario, friends and colleagues gather to celebrate one woman's achievements. She's a renowned archaeologist who has received a prestigious honor. And she's in love with a man who's not intimidated by her success. Her life is perfect, but not for long. Sometimes, when you least expect it, Christmas is a time when everything gets taken away. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free, no subscription required. Download Veely now. Make sure to like and subscribe. Hamilton police get a call from McMaster University. The dispatcher then alerts Detective Sergeant John Reed. It's been 20 years, but Reed can still remember the call. The phone rang, and I heard that ominous uh, announcement, Sarge. I think we've got a homicide. Immediately, the adrenaline starts flowing and everything swings into high gear. By the time Detective Reed arrives, the crime scene has already been secured. A janitor at McMaster University has made a terrible discovery. The dead woman is Dora Ferguson, a professor of archaeology. It was quite obvious that fall play was involved. The janitor tells Reed he didn't see Professor Ferguson this morning, but she did call to ask that he turn up the heat in her office. He logged the call in at 10.30. When he came round to check on the heat at 11.30, he discovered the body. We entered the office very carefully to get a brief idea of what had transpired. Reed can see this case is going to be anything but simple. She was lying on the floor, face down, handcuffed, and had tape over her mouth and eyes. Her slacks had been pulled down partially. One of her boots had been removed. There was something uh, of a sexual nature in this, this whole thing. And here we are, broad daylight, a university campus and something like this happens, how could it happen? It's got to be somebody that knows her. That's the first thing that goes through your mind. This cannot be a random act. It was a student, colleague, lover? There was so much whirling through your mind right then. Why would somebody kill her? Why? Reed is still working the scene when Professor Marks arrives. He's Dora Ferguson's boyfriend. Marx is determined to find out what happened. Reed gives him the bad news. You see, he was a state of shock. You see him shaking his head, and he could tell that he didn't really believe this was happening. But there's little niggling doubts in the back of your mind that maybe this is the person who did it. We don't know. And we're not going to know until we ask questions. Through him, we learned a lot about the victim. She had graduated from Oxford, had a PhD in Roman history, had written books, had been in an archaeological digs uh, in Italy and in North Africa, and she was very well respected. Mark says the night before the murder, he and Dora had celebrated her election into the Royal Canadian Society.
Dora had never seemed happier. Today, they planned to go Christmas shopping. They were supposed to meet at 11 o'clock. He knew that when she's in the office, she always kept the door open. He arrives at the office for their, their meeting, and her door's closed and locked. He knocks on the door, knocks on the door. There's no answer. He wasn't overly alarmed. He was a little baffled, because she's a very punctual type person. He thought, something's come up. Marks checked to see if any of Dora's colleagues knew where she was. No one had seen her. After you talk to someone long enough, you get certain feelings. There was nothing to indicate this man was lying. And there was everything to indicate he was telling the truth. We did not believe he was in any way involved. Reed now knows that Dora Ferguson was alive at 10.30, nowhere to be found at 11, and dead at 11.30. But he doesn't know what happened in that time frame. Reed decides to check the contents of her purse. We looked through her personal belongings. There was no driver's license, there was no credit card, and it seemed a little unusual. Was this robbery, sexual assault, or premeditated murder? It was very confusing. A lot more questions than answers. Reed hopes the autopsy will help clarify things. Despite the sexual nature of the attack, there is no evidence of sexual assault. But hidden beneath the tape, stuffed inside the victim's mouth, the pathologist finds a rag. She had a medical condition where she couldn't breathe through her nose. So once her mouth had been taped shut, she couldn't breathe. She was asphyxiated. You start to wonder, was this homicide deliberate? The pathologist finds something else peculiar. I did not see any sign of struggle, no injury whatsoever on her body. So that indicated to me uh, something has happened to her to subdue her. Otherwise, I'm sure she would have put up a fight. Dr. Rao asks if police found anything else near the body. One of the uniform police officers called me and he said, Dr. Rao, there was a green terry towel next to her face. So the first thing came to my mind was chloroform. If chloroform was used, traces would remain in the victim's bloodstream. Dr. Rao orders blood toxicology tests. In our system, there was 1.9 milligram percent of chloroform. That was enough to render a person unconscious. Did the attacker intend to kill her? He certainly came prepared to. With a homicide investigation, it's like that jigsaw puzzle. You have a little piece here, a little piece there, a little piece, and you're trying to fit them in. But at this point, nothing seems to fit. A respected university professor has been murdered. While the attack was sexual in nature, there is no evidence of a sexual assault. The day after the murder, Detective Reed returns to the campus. He finds it deserted. The overwhelming majority of people, and especially from that building, were leaving, going other places for the Christmas holiday. So it just seemed that everything was working against us. Reed interviews the few faculty members who remain. He wants to know if Professor Ferguson had enemies. Professor Clemens says that Dora Ferguson was widely admired. He can't think of anyone who would want to hurt her, but on the morning of the murder, Clemens did see someone strange. A large woman entered his office, but she left before he could ask what she wanted. We also spoke to other people who spotted an unusual-looking person wandering around, who looked more like a caricature than a real person. So more and more, we started thinking that this unusual-looking person should be questioned in regards to this crime. The problem is, she's nowhere to be found. Reed obtains a search warrant for the dead woman's house. 
we searched her home, we found credit card receipts. So this immediately opened up a whole new avenue of investigation. The receipts prove Professor Ferguson had credit cards. The killer must have stolen them. If those cards have been used, the police now have a way of tracking her down. Less than 72 hours into the investigation, Detective John Reed gets his first big break. Someone used Dora Ferguson's credit cards right after her murder. The forged signature looks nothing like the professor's. All the store clerks give Reed the same description. Very big person, over 200 pounds. And to many of them, they were saying, it looks like a man dressed up like a woman. The wig. The makeup, of course. Women's clothing, but it didn't, it didn't look right. Sometimes you'll see men who dress up like women, and they do a pretty good job of it. This looked more like a man trying to dress up like a woman and not doing a very good job of it. Well, we started thinking we were looking at uh, a transvestite. Using the store clerk's description, a composite sketch of the suspect is produced, then distributed throughout the Hamilton area. When Reed turns to Hamilton's small transvestite population for help, he's directed to a popular nightclub. These were completely new waters that we were wading into here. We made some contact in the transvestite community, and these people were very helpful. They said, look, we may like to dress up like women. We don't go around killing people. And if we can help you in any way, we will. The transvestite community is close-knit. They all know each other. But nobody has seen anyone who looks like the composite. Maybe the suspect is only using women's clothing as a disguise. The next day, Reed learns that a student has recognized the sketch. She says it's the man who's been stalking her on campus. She finds his lewd remarks disturbing. We asked questions around campus, and we were able to come up with a name. And from that name, we were able to uh, track this person down. The stalker's name is Victor Shelley. If you look at the composite drawing, you look at him, you just said, that's looking pretty good. He admitted, yeah, he sometimes made a nuisance for himself with the girls out there, but he said, well, just the pretty ones. So we focused on him, really focused on him, including doing a search of his premises and everything else. Detective Reed asks the young man for a handwriting sample. He realized what we were doing. He didn't, um, he didn't mind being a suspect. If I can help out, he says, I certainly will. And he did. Expert handwriting analysts compare his notes to the forged receipts. There are no similarities. After a period of time, we realize he may look like it, but it's not him. Reed's only suspect has just been eliminated. Christmas has come and gone. The university is once again filled with students, but Professor Ferguson's murder has not been forgotten. In early January, Reed receives word that someone matching the suspect's description has been spotted on another university campus, 65 kilometers away. Sergeant Dave McCullough is sent to Brock University to investigate. The description, a large, uh, overweight male wearing female attire, uh, looking really bizarre. The police are unable to locate the suspect. Fearful he may strike again, they decide to go public with the investigation. The newspaper article prompts a number of tips, but only one is bizarre enough to make police believe they've finally found their killer. continue to search for a man who wears women's clothes. He may have murdered Professor Dora Ferguson. Now a tip may lead police to his door. 
one evening the young lady was home alone there was a knock at the door and she opened the door and there was a person standing there with handcuffs and wearing female attire and she knew the person he lived downstairs but uh, she didn't let him in she slammed the door the man fits the description the Brock University suspect was seen wearing the same outfit when she saw the composite sketch in the newspaper, the young woman called police. The suspect is identified as Michael Crowley. He has no police record, not even a traffic ticket. He said, I've been expecting you. I said, oh, really? Why is that? He said, well, it's about this transvestite business in Hamilton. I said, yeah, that's right. And again, being ever diplomatic, I said, look, if you haven't done anything, you have nothing to worry about. And he says, well, I've got nothing to worry about. So I says, fine, we have a search warrant here for your house. In Crowley's apartment, police find a closet full of women's clothes. Crowley admits he's a transvestite. To get into the mind of a suspect, investigators consult with behavioral profilers. Transvestic uh, fetishism is almost exclusively something that heterosexual males engage in, mainly for the purpose of getting some sexual pleasure from it. There were magazines stacked all around the, the house. Most of the magazines were of the bondage with uh, women in sexual positions, tied up, gagged with tape, handcuffed. Often sexual bondage material is consistent with somebody who's interested in sexual sadism in that they want to imagine that they can tie somebody up and cause their pain and suffering. But the detectives need more than women's clothing and magazines to prove Michael Crowley is a killer. We searched the house thoroughly, didn't find any credit cards, didn't find any of the stolen items. But McCullough has an idea. So I placed a piece of paper in front of him. I said, uh, I'd like you to write in the victim's name on this piece of paper. My partner was coming up and I turned to talk to him for a few seconds. And uh, when I turned back, he practically filled the page with the victim's name. I'm not a handwriting expert, but I have to tell you the hair on the back of my neck stood up. And I thought, holy smokes. And he still kept writing. I said, Michael. He said, stop. I took the pen off him. I said, Michael. You killed the lady. And he sort of collapsed and sobbing. I didn't mean to kill her. I didn't mean to kill her. Crowley claims he only intended to rob Dora Ferguson. But police know he came prepared to do far more than that. Quite often, they will try and say that all they were there for was to steal something. Uh, they will downplay the sexual component of it. Um, because the sexual component of it to society is much more distasteful than stealing. As Crowley starts to confess, McCullough pieces together what happened on the last day of Dora Ferguson's life. He applied his makeup, uh, his wig, put on the ladies' wear. He drove to Hamilton that Saturday morning. He then drove to McMaster knew his way around McMaster because he'd been there on prior occasions. At 10.30, Professor Ferguson was waiting for her boyfriend. Feeling chilled, she called the janitor to ask that the heat be turned up. Crowley roamed the campus, looking for an opportunity to strike. That I think that was probably all his criteria was that day, is to find a female that he could challenge and control. He was wandering the halls, walked past this office. The door was open. There was a lady sitting there with her back to him, working at a desk. Whenever we see a, a sexual offense uh, between two strangers, the motivation is almost always power or anger. sexual crimes 
um, especially ones that are, are committed by a, a fantasy motivated offender, quite often will see their sexually deviant interest to come out in that crime. But Crowley didn't get to carry out his sexual assault. The suspect told us while he was in there, there was a knock at the door. Dora. Her boyfriend came and knocked on the door while Crowley was still in there. This made Crowley change his plan. He stole Professor Ferguson's credit cards and fled. He had knocked her out with chloroform, gagged her with a towel. It never occurred to him that she might have stopped breathing. So I told him, you're under arrest for murder. And he sat there still sobbing, reached into his pocket, and he came out with a little glass vial. And he handed it to me. I said, what's this? He said, it's cyanide. He said, I knew you guys would catch me. I said, he said I was going to take it. But he didn't. People have certain uh, stereotypes of uh, murder. If you looked at him, he looked completely opposite from anything you would expect. I think he was ashamed, he was embarrassed, he was sorry. I don't think for one minute it was intended to go as far as it did. Only 24 days after Dora Ferguson's murder, Michael Crowley is arrested. Even if it's accidental, a homicide committed during a sexual assault is treated the same as first-degree murder. Crowley pleads guilty and is sentenced to 25 years. The case is closed, but for someone like Dora Ferguson, it's hard to imagine a less fitting end. What a wonderful person she was, how much she contributed. I mean, whatever she touched turned to gold except on that sad day. You give most family people a choice between living downtown and moving to the suburbs, they're going to take the suburbs every time. Why wouldn't they? More room, better services, and most of all, the suburbs are safe. At least, they're supposed to be. When a terrible crime takes place in a nice neighborhood, you have to ask yourself, was it an act of random violence? Or could there be a problem in the home? Crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Just a few miles east of Seattle, Washington, Bellevue Police receive a 911 call. Officer Jim Kowalsik responds. The radio dispatcher advised that some people had come home and they found bodies covered in blood. That was actually the second officer to arrive on the scene. The first officer had gotten there moments before me. And he was talking to two young males uh, out in front of uh, the house. Atif Rafay and his friend, Sebastian Burns, say they just found Atif's family dead in their home. They say they also heard noises. The killer may still be inside. So we kind of pushed the door open and just listened, you know, listened, using our senses, uh, watching, trying to hear, even smell, to see uh, was there anything to give an indication of what was going on or had gone in, in, in the house and we decided to go upstairs. We went up to the top of the landing and again stopped just to listen and watch and uh, see what we could see. What we saw was a man's body on a bed. On the wall behind the, the bed itself was a massive arc of blood and tissue. A very bloody scene. Uh, the man was obviously deceased. He had no face. 
Beside the bed, there's an open wallet. My inclination was that this was someone that had just shot their, their, their head off with a shotgun. Like they just put their wallet down because they're not going to be able to recognize me, laid on the bed and blew my head off. The police continue their search. Down the hall, they hear a noise. Officer Kowalsik finds a second victim, a young woman. She's bleeding from a head wound, but still alive. He calls for paramedics. The young woman is rushed to hospital, but the search is not over. So then we went back and down the stairs. I hear Paul yell, I've got another one. The back of her head covering was soaked in blood. Police have found three victims, but no intruder. They return to the dead man's room. Both Paul and I had thought, okay, this person had killed the two women, then went up, laid on the bed and blew his head off. And his, his hand was up here by his, by his face. And we thought, well, maybe it was like a very powerful handgun. A 44 Magnum could cause that damage. The only problem is no gun can be found. Something's wrong. If this was a homicide suicide, then somebody moved part of the evidence. I asked the officers that were sitting in, in the car with Atif and Sebastian to ask them if they moved anything. The boys insist they touch nothing inside the house. If that's the case, police are looking at a multiple murder. Homicide detective Bob Thompson arrives to take charge of the investigation. When I initially went in, I went downstairs, and uh, that's when I observed Mrs. Raffae. Thompson soon determines how Atif's mother was killed. She had two blows to the head. One was uh, in the back of her head, and the other was uh, just over her ear. Thompson also finds a VCR has gone missing from the family's home entertainment center. In Atif's sister's bedroom, Thompson notes something else. Just uh, a general observation of that room, there had been what looked like a struggle. There was impact where a weapon had hit the wall. She was fighting for her life in that room. In the master bedroom, Atif's father had no chance to put up a fight. It was clear that he was asleep at the time of the murder, and he never knew what hit him. He had been hit in the face numerous times, and I would just guess, you know, 40 to 50 times. The attacker never missed. On the carpet, Thompson finds a circular pattern of blood. It's about the same size as the top of a baseball bat. What you have is what initially looked like a burglary which seemed incredible. It, I mean, that somebody come in in the middle of the night and steal a VCR and kill an entire family. Atif Rafay tells Detective Thompson he can't think of anyone who would want to hurt his family. They moved to Bellevue from Vancouver four months ago. His father, Tariq, was a structural engineer. His mother, Sultana, gave up her career as a dietitian to take care of his sister, Bosma, who's autistic and hasn't spoken since she was four. Atif explains that he's on summer break from university. He's been staying at Sebastian's house in Vancouver. They just drove down for a visit five days ago. He seemed to be very disengaged, I guess would be a, a word which isn't all that uncommon for someone who's just observed the trauma of his entire family being murdered. Atif must now contact relatives and make funeral arrangements. Thompson is sympathetic. I had the impression that he just didn't want to deal with any of this. And ultimately what we did was we said, you know what, you know, you've been up all night long. We're going to put you up in a, a, a local hotel and you need to get some sleep. We'll come back and talk to you later. Thompson needs to send the boys' clothes to the lab. He has Officer Kowalsik bring them some new clothes. 
At first, Sebastian and Atif resist. Thompson explains, they walk through the crime scene. Forensic analysis of their clothing is standard procedure. It's been a long night. When Thompson returns to his office, he gets a call from the hospital. Bosma Rafay has succumbed to her injuries. She was the only witness to the murders, and now she's gone. Three members of the Rafay family have just been found murdered in their Bellevue, Washington home. The sole survivor, Atif Rafay, says he was out with his friend Sebastian Burns at the time of the murders. Both have given statements the police must now verify. The pair say they left the Rafay's house at 8.30 and drove to Seattle, where they had coffee and dessert at a local restaurant. They left the Cape restaurant, walked across the street, went and saw a movie. They went to the 9.50 showing. After the movie, they said that they went to a all-night cafe. According to the waitress, they arrived there about 10 minutes to one. She says she remembers the teeth and Sebastian very well. Sebastian was talkative and charming. He asked if there were any good nightclubs nearby. She suggested the weathered wall, just a few blocks away. They left her a big tip. Twenty minutes later, they came back to use the restroom. Sebastian told her the club was closed. They left the all-night cafe at 1.30 and drove back to Bellevue. Sebastian's 911 call was logged at 2.03. The boys' statements check out. The lab finds nothing unusual on their clothing. Detective Thompson has Officer Kowalsik drop by the motel to see how the boys are doing. It looked like the light was on, so I knocked on the door, and Sebastian came to the door. He was wearing nothing but his uh, underwear, no shirt, and I noticed back in behind him was a thief standing there in his jockey shorts. I, I can't speculate anything other than they felt I was an intruder. I just asked him if everything was okay, do you need anything, and it was uh, Sebastian was obviously in charge, in that, at least in that room. And he just said, nope, we're fine. Uh, leave us alone. The door was slammed in my face, so I left him alone. Kowalsik tells Detective Thompson about the boy's behavior. Thompson says he finds something else odd. The first four nights the boys were in town, they stayed home and watched TV. Why so much activity on the night of the murders? We decided, you know what, let's just wait. The following day was going to be the funeral. We had family coming into town, uh, and they may be able to provide some more insight into who may be responsible. The next day, Thompson sends a forensic team to the Rafay house to gather more evidence. Lead forensic investigator, Kay Sweeney, zeroes in on the blood on the floor. I noted it was a drip pattern. It didn't look like a wound because it was fairly infrequent blood dripping, so it was more probably a weapon, some implement that was bloody that was dripping. The drops of blood lead from Tariq Rafay's bedroom to every outside door in the house. That indicates someone is checking to see the doors are locked. Uh, more likely than someone intends to spend some time inside the residence. And one of the reasons for spending time on the scene beyond searching for valuables and taking them is to clean up. Sweeney sprays leucomalachite on the bathroom walls. Green would indicate the presence of blood. And when I sprayed that shower stall, it lit up like a Christmas tree. Green specks all over the walls. Clearly, someone covered in blood took a shower here. In examining the bathroom, of course, I'm interested not only in the blood spatter and blood stains, but also if there's any hair. Sweeney finds a light brown hair that may well belong to the killer. In Tariq Rafay's bedroom, Sweeney analyzes the blood spatter to see what else he can find. I used straight line angle determination and determine an arc of swing. 
And in, term, in determining that arc of swing, then I can determine the height of a person swinging the bat. And the height of that person, uh, based on the arc of the swing, was six feet or more. Sweeney believes he now knows two things about the killer. He's six feet tall, and he has light brown hair, just like Sebastian Burns. I advised the investigators not to let the two boys out of their sight. Thompson sends an officer to the funeral to keep an eye on the boys. But Atif and Sebastian don't show up. We went back to the hotel, found that they weren't at the room, and um, it was a short time later we learned that they had just crossed the border into Canada. They were bound for Vancouver from Seattle on a Greyhound. 72 hours after the murders, Detective Thompson's prime suspects have fled the country. Police are looking for Atif Raffay and Sebastian Burns, the two prime suspects in the Raffay family murder case. The day after they fled the United States, Detective Bob Thompson arrives in Vancouver, BC. We contacted the local agency there to let them know we were in town. And uh, we were going around with them. They were helping us out with addresses. Thompson learns the boys are staying at a high school friend's condo. The detective wants to know why Atif and Sebastian disappeared. Do they have something to hide? Sebastian is outraged at the insinuation. He says he and Atif have done nothing wrong. We wanted hair and uh, blood samples from Burns and Raffae that we could use to match things that we would found at the crime scene. And ultimately, our conversations with them broke down to the point that they wouldn't speak to us. We found that no matter where we went, they were telling other people, don't talk to the police. Detective Thompson decides to visit Atif and Sebastian's old high school. One particular school teacher enlightened us, and she said that they were arrogant people that would cause trouble for other people at their expense, which didn't mean that they were murderers, but it wasn't painting a picture that was very attractive either. That's not the only thing Thompson learns. Looking through a year-old high school annual, Sebastian Burns had been in a play that was called Rope. Rope is based on the famous Leopold and Loeb case, in which two young male lovers attempt to commit the perfect murder. When you read something like that, I mean, that, I mean, that piques your interest. Forensic psychologist Stephen Hart is familiar with the case. Tifa Faye and Sebastian Burns actually developed a friendship in high school um, where they saw each other as having somewhat complementary skills or abilities. On their own, individually, uh, they may have been uh, a little bit of, of uh, an outcast, a little bit of a loser. It seems like once they hooked up, they started to develop a real sense of power. Raffae and Burns have been getting a lot of media attention in Vancouver. The uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, were reading in the newspapers about a couple of murder suspects running around in Vancouver. We met with the RCMP and told them about the case investigation that we had. They wanted to know what the Bellevue Police Department needed from them. The RCMP know that even though the murders were committed in the United States, they may well have been planned in Canada. The RCMP are happy to help. They set up a sting operation and put their man in place. The RCMP operative introduces himself as Frankie. He says he recognizes Sebastian from all those articles in the papers. Sebastian tells Frankie it's all a crock. He's innocent. After a few drinks, Sebastian says he and his friend Atif plan to make a movie about two young men who have been wrongly accused of murder. But movies are expensive, and Sebastian has no money. No one will hire him right now because of all the bad press. Frankie says he has underworld connections. If Sebastian wants to come work for him, he can make some easy money. 
Over the next several months, the undercover officer immerses Sebastian and a thief in a make-believe world of money laundering and drugs. Frankie then springs the trap. He says he has a job for them. If they eliminate a rival drug dealer for him, he'll pay them, big time. But first, he needs to know if the accusations are true. Are they killers? After stonewalling for months, Atif and Sebastian are eager to open up. Not only did they confess to it, but they were laughing about it when they were confessing. They showed no remorse at all. Um, they, they showed no um, emotion. In the police video, Atif explains how they planned everything to the last detail. It was to be the perfect crime. They bought tickets to the 950 movie, but they never intended to see it. Instead, they slipped out the exit and immediately returned to the Rafay house to commit the murders. They knew Atif's father would be asleep by that time. Sebastian is the stronger of the two. He would do the dirty work. They stripped down to their underwear to avoid getting blood on their clothes. Atif's mother was an embarrassment to him. She'd thrown away her life to look after his feeble-minded sister. It made him sick. Atif's father was a devout Muslim who opposed his choices in life. Atif wanted to make movies. His father wanted him to be an engineer. Sebastian boasts how smart he and Atif were. They left his autistic sister for last because they knew she couldn't cry out for help. Then they got in the shower and washed away all traces of the murders. Or so they thought. When they went to the all-night cafe, they deliberately left a large tip. So the waitress would remember them. At 2 a.m., they returned home to discover the horrific murders. Then they called 911. Frankie asks how it felt. They say killing the family was inconvenient, but it had to be done. They needed financing for their movie, The Great Despisers. The Rafay's insurance policies and the estate it was worth uh, nearly half a million dollars. In order for Atif Rafay to get access to the inheritance, his entire family had to die. Money may be um, the manifest motive, but the latent motive is really about taking power and control, exerting power and control in the family, in a sense, taking out the existing power structure of a family. They despised other people. They wanted to feel superior to other people. They wanted to feel separate and apart and distinct from other people. Now they will be. Atif Rafay and Sebastian Burns will spend the rest of their lives in a Washington state penitentiary. Great storytellers are liars. Everybody knows it. Nobody cares. As long as the stories have intrigue, adventure, romance. But what if the storyteller takes it one step too far? What if he starts living out his fantasies? Suddenly, it's not just entertainment anymore. Chances are, somebody's going to get hurt. Investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere.
in the first 72 hours. November 6, 2002. Sergeant Bill Napier is in charge of the Major Crimes Unit in Winnipeg. There's just been a bank robbery. Napier and his squad interview witnesses and secure the scene. Teller Mary Anderson tells police the robber didn't seem nervous at all. The teller is, is extremely traumatized. She fears not only for her own safety, uh, but for the safety of her child, because uh, this was a national take your child to work day, and her son was present in the bank at the time of the robbery. Though terrified, she had the presence of mind to slip a dye pack in with the bills. That's it. Dye pack is uh, an explosive device that's uh, placed in the cash to detonate once it leaves the bank. The objective of this, obviously, is to destroy some of the cash and put evidence from the bank robbery onto the suspect. In the alley behind the bank, police soon discover the dye pack has done its job. They find uh, clothing that has been discarded by the suspect and the actual firearm that was used in the robbery. Police hope to find fingerprints and traces of DNA. They send the evidence to the RCMP for analysis. Sergeant Napier studies the bank's surveillance tapes, but all they reveal is that the robber is heavy set. Typically in, uh, in our city, we, we have a lot of robberies that occur uh, by substance abusers, crack addicts that are uh, much thinner than this intimidating suspect. Because of the suspect's size, He's dubbed the Fat Bandit. Police track down and interview anyone who fits the description. Sergeant Alan Bell is one of the detectives assigned to work the robbery. We had no suspects, positive, direct suspects in mind. Uh, we had done all of our usual checks, and we weren't able to come up with anybody that we could directly focus our investigation on. Two months later, the fat bandit strikes again. He's netting less than $3,000 a robbery. Police ask themselves, why risk so much for so little? Bank robbers are an unpredictable breed, according to criminologist Doug Skoog. Guys that rob banks are unusual guys. It's a very dangerous kind of crime to get involved in. Uh, but they love the thrill, the tension before doing it, the kind of rush that they get when they go into a bank. They seem to like it, I think, because of that kind of adrenaline rush and the thrill that they get from it. So they continue to do it, oftentimes even when the rewards aren't that great. police bulletin comes in. On January 13th, I received a fan out from the Vancouver Police Service uh, with images, uh, captured images of a surveillance camera on the exterior of a bank that had been robbed in their jurisdiction on January 10th. Based on these images, police surmise it's the fat bandit. Somewhat out of the ordinary, when we get people doing robberies in such a concentrated time frame, they're usually staying in the one location. Now we've got somebody who is basically cross Canada. The fat bandit is soon back in Winnipeg. Within three weeks, there are four more robberies. The city is on alert. Pressure's on police to catch him. The case is getting a lot of media attention. Each day that a bank is robbed, it, it makes the evening news. The video surveillance images the police now have are good enough to broadcast. Police hope the public will call in with tips. The tips lead nowhere. The fat bandit's identity remains unknown. Now, police fears are starting to mount. 
we were becoming frustrated um, because of, of the weapon and the increased frequencies. We were concerned that somebody was going to try to do something to stop them and somebody's going to get hurt. On February 7th, the fat bandit commits his seventh robbery in three months. But this time, a man who lives near the bank is able to tell police what he saw. An SUV pulled up. A man took off some clothes and threw them in the back. Then he changed the license plates and drove off. The witness never saw his face. Police now have a solid ID on his vehicle, a black Yukon. They know his height, his weight, what he drives. Police also have a geographic profile of his robberies. After the February 10th robbery, we determined that the suspect likes the southwest quadrant of the city. We suspect strongly that either he lives in that area or has some reason for committing crimes in that specific area of the city. Napier now has 40 undercover officers staking out banks in southwest Winnipeg, and another 10 officers cruising the area in unmarked cars. All we wanted to do at this point was find this individual and rip his mask off. February 14th, Valentine's Day. Suddenly the call came over the radio that uh, robbery had just occurred to a bank on Waterloo, which was out of our area. Detective Bell spots a large black SUV leaving the scene at high speed. He joins the chase. We were third unit in line, I guess, about a mile back from the vehicle. He got onto the perimeter highway, but suddenly he made another westbound turn off of the perimeter and went westbound on a dirt road. We were second unit in line behind a marked cruiser, just a basic single lane dirt road doing 160 to 180 kilometers an hour and no signs of him slowing down whatsoever. The driver finally skids into a ditch. Police have him cornered. They know he's armed. He could be dangerous. Detective Bell orders him to give up his weapon and surrender. The fat bandit is about to be unmasked. Winnipeg police have finally caught up with the man responsible for at least eight armed robberies. His car doors are blocked by snow. His only way out is through the window. It's the moment they've been waiting for. But he's not what they expect. We looked at him and he could be anybody's uncle. And with his build, he could put a Santa suit on and he could be Santa at Christmas time. According to his ID, the fat bandit's real name is Klaus Berlikow. In the cruiser, he was extremely upset. He was crying. He said he was ashamed of what he had done, that this was going to ruin his family. He was quoting Shakespeare. I remember him quoting passages from Paradise Lost. At that point, I kind of realized that this wasn't your regular down and out bank robber. That this guy had you know, somewhat of a normal life at some point in time. It turns out Berlikow's life is anything but normal. Until a year ago, he was a well-known senior bureaucrat working for the city of Winnipeg. He helped organize many high-profile civic events, among them the Pan American Games. City councillor Harry Lazarenko has known Klaus Berlikow for 20 years. I was shocked. I thought that this was not the person. I thought it had to be another person with that name. He was in charge of the downtown festival with as many as 200 to 300,000 people. I'm saying that this man was capable. He was good at organizing. Police are baffled. How does someone go from making six figures a year to robbing banks? Berlikow begins to tell his story. 
It's difficult for me to explain how I got from that point to where I am here uh, today. When Berlakow stopped working for the city, he got a $170,000 severance package. He decided to reinvent himself as an events planner, focusing on Celtic music. I decided that the best opportunities uh, for that particular business would exist on the West Coast. Berlakow says he made contact with some venture capitalists who set him up with a business partner in Seattle. According to Berlikow, he met his new partner and handed over his life savings. The plan was to stage a series of concerts. Berlikow was excited. He was asked to transport concert merchandise across the border. But when he was also asked to transport drugs, Berlikow refused. I got involved with a world that and people that I couldn't have imagined and ended up way over my head. Berlikow says that when he refused to transport drugs, his partner lost money, which he now wanted repaid, with interest. I liquidated everything that I had uh, in an attempt to pay them and uh, borrowed where I could. Failure to do so would, would have had some pretty serious consequences for me, and uh, potentially for my family. These guys meant business. Berlikow needed money fast. It was then he decided to start robbing banks. There, there was a sense of disassociation. I, I really didn't think of myself as being the person doing this. When when I was in there, I was terrified. Um, my heart was pounding. And, and when I left, there was an instant sense of remorse of, of having done it, shame of having um, put myself in a position where I felt that I, I needed to do this. Was Klaus Berlikow really robbing banks to protect his loved ones from mobsters and drug dealers? As police begin to investigate his story, they get a surprising call from a woman in Seattle. She says they've made a mistake. The man they have in custody is no bank robber. He's her business partner, Patrick Burke, an Irish millionaire. Kathy Taylor, a Seattle dental hygienist and mother of two, says she hasn't heard from her partner since Valentine's Day. We were terrified that something had happened to him. So we hit Winnipeg Sun, and the first thing that comes up on the screen is a picture of him and uh, ex-senior bureaucrat arrested for armed bank robbery. It has to be a mistake. You know, they've got the wrong picture with the article or something wrong. Winnipeg police assure her there's no mistake. About a half an hour after this conversation, the FBI calls my home and tells me that they need to meet with me because my partner just robbed several Canadian banks and they were afraid that he'd been robbing banks in Washington as well. I passed out. I fainted dead cold. Bank robber, senior civil servant, Irish millionaire. The pieces don't fit. Who is this guy, really? Former civil servant Klaus Berlikow has told Winnipeg police that he became a bank robber to pay back West Coast mobsters. Now, police learn he may have another identity. The information we receive from uh, this witness in Seattle, we take very seriously. Um, we act upon it and uh, try and establish if there's any credibility to the fact that he was using the alias Patrick Burke. Berlikow freely admits he traveled under an assumed name. 
frankly, I've never been all that fond of my name. Uh, it's, it speaks to an ethnicity that I don't embrace. Berlikau won't talk to the police about Kathy Taylor, but Kathy Taylor is happy to talk about him. I met him in an online chat room, and I was moving through chat rooms of different countries, and I picked Ireland, and this, this person sent me an instant message, and his nickname was Tin Whistle. He's brilliant, and he is amazingly funny. I mean, I finally would turn him off sometimes and just get up for the computer and walk around and get away from it because I was dying. He's hysterical. First time we met was in a bar, and I had some friends sitting to the side because, you know, it's an internet thing. He told her all about his childhood in Northern Ireland, how he joined the IRA after his best friend was killed by stray bullets. Now, he said, he wanted to set up an events planning business in Seattle. He wanted Taylor to be his partner. He chose Seattle because it reminded him so much of his home in Ireland. The mist over the water and the, the mist through the forest. He had the cutest Irish accent. He was just a round, jolly little Irishman. But he told me one time that he could live in the Sorrento Hotel at $600 a night for the rest of his life and never be out of money. Police are shocked to learn Taylor was in Vancouver with her new partner the day he robbed a bank. On January 10th, he asked me to ride to Vancouver with him because he was going to meet with an investor. Well, I got upset and said, I'm going with you. I'm a partner in this company, and I'm going with you to meet with this investor. He said, no, you're not, because these are old school guys, and they don't want to have any woman involved in the business. He gave her his credit card and told her to go spend his money in the mall. And then later I found out that while I was shopping on his card, he robbed a bank. On the way back, he was fine. He was jovial and happy that he'd found some more investors and uh, things were moving right along with the business. Berlikau continues to insist that drug dealing mobsters were behind his crime spree. Taylor tells police she has her doubts. Every time he was here in Seattle, I was here, and I never saw any mob affiliation. Uh, what I'm saying is, is the truth. Uh, to the extent that I can tell the truth uh, about this without endangering myself or my family, I, I have told the truth. He said, she said. Which story did the police believe? Criminologist Doug Skoog says he'd go with Taylor. If you look at Berlico's behavior, it shows this impulsivity, this egocentrism, this lack of concern for others. Skoog believes Berlico is a pathological liar. The only person that they really love is themselves. And, you know, he found, you know, having this money and being able to throw it around uh, fun and enjoyable but I don't think for a moment that it was to save his family in Winnipeg. I think he was just unhappy and bored with his life, and he needed a really good life fix. The media just won't let go of the story. I was thinking, this is something like Jesse James. It was like getting into a soap opera. Every day, I'd be reading the paper, watching the television. The stories would be coming out day by day. I think the media got caught up in, in what was indeed an interesting story, where you have a six-figure-a-year upper-middle-class individual robbing banks, but the error that the media makes, when a rich person is involved in crime, they try to find deep psychological you know, motivations. When poor people commit crime, they did it because they're greedy. Berlico robbed the banks because he was greedy. I felt satisfied that the uh, suspect had been arrested given the fact of uh, all the, the, the victim tellers that he had terrorized during his crime spree. At the end of the day, he was just another bank robber. 
All the evidence that police collected in the 72 hours after Berlikow's first bank robbery, the eyewitness accounts, the surveillance tapes, the clothing, has led to this moment. Klaus Berlikow pleaded guilty and was sentenced to eight years in jail. Oh my gosh, those inmates are gonna have a, a great time. Lots of laughs. He was the greatest storyteller I'll ever know. Berlikow has plenty of time to think about the stories he'll tell. When he's released from Canadian prison, he faces a series of similar charges in Washington state. People tell stories all the time. But if you're a detective, the trick is knowing who to believe. Let's say it's a woman calling in. She sounds scared. She tells you she's got this friend who just showed up at her front door in hysterics. Her friend said she was out last night with her boyfriend. They were driving around. He kept reaching for something in the back seat. It was just an ordinary bucket, her friend said. But when she looked inside, she found a human head. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Vancouver police detectives have just been told a strange story about a severed head in a bucket they don't know what to make of it. When I talk to my partner about this initial information, you're always somewhat skeptical because we often get phone calls in the homicide office and people claiming pretty outrageous things, and then there's no uh, evidence to support it. Was it a crank call? Bath and his partner, Detective Rick Crook, decide to find out. They pay the caller a visit. Her name is Susan Farland. She's divorced, living at home with her mother, and coping with mental illness. She told us up front that she was bipolar. The detectives know that people with bipolar disorders often experience dramatic swings in mood and perception. My partner and I were both familiar with the disorder, but at that point, we weren't prepared to write up the story. The detectives asked Susan to give a full account of what her friend saw. She was articulate. She was quite intelligent. She started telling a story which contained a lot of detail. Susan says she and her friend Leanne sometimes hang out at a local club. Leanne is the one who told Susan about the head in the bucket. Leanne's boyfriend Michael is always there. Michael is a drug dealer with a reputation for violence. Not long ago, Susan met a new guy named Vagar. He seemed nice enough, but he also seemed to have a serious drug problem. Susan tells detectives that the day after Leanne's hysterical visit, she showed up at her door again this time with Michael. Michael knew Leanne had told Susan about the head in the bucket. He insisted that she come for a drive with them. Susan was afraid to go, but even more afraid of what Michael would do if she didn't. They drove to a garage. Once inside, Susan met someone she recognized, a friend of Michael's named Jim. It seemed obvious to her that they were cleaning up after themselves. Susan says Michael became angry. 
He told her he wanted to make sure she understood what happened to people who betrayed him. Susan says she knew the face. It was Vagar, the guy she met at the club a few weeks before. She saw the face, and it wasn't until later, I think, that the full impact of this hit her and started to take effect on her. Susan is terrified of what Michael will do if he finds out she's gone to the police. She doesn't want to say any more. But the detectives need to know what happened next. She says that Michael wanted to store the head in her garage. She didn't know what else to say, so she said, yeah, you can do that. Susan says she was scared to say no. Michael seemed to be telling her what to do, not asking. It was moved to her garage overnight. Susan says she was worried she might be implicated in the crime. That night, she couldn't sleep. In the morning, Susan told Leanne and Michael, this has to be gotten rid of. Susan was too afraid to even talk to Michael when he came by the house. That was three weeks ago. She's been trying to work up the courage to call the police ever since. They still aren't sure they believe her. If we are going to launch into a large investigation, are we working on an investigation of a murder? Or is this fiction? We had to prove her story. Bath and Crook begin a database search of the names Susan has given them. She supplied quite a number of claims that we could then go and start to investigate to see if there was any validity to her story. Police discover that Michael Illis is a known drug dealer. He does have an associate named James, or Jim Thompson. Susan told police it was Vagar's head she saw in the bucket. When police enter his name, it too produces a hit. Vagar Cushman is known to police and has a history of drug-related charges. There's something else about him that backs up Susan's story. He had gone missing, reported by his family, around the time that she talked about having seen his head in a bucket. We were starting to become a little more convinced that perhaps there was something to this. 72 hours after hearing a story about a head in a bucket, police discover a missing persons report. If the two occurrences are connected, they have a murder on their hands. Vancouver police detectives know that if Susan Farland's story is true, a man named Michael Illis has likely committed murder. Illis is a Hungarian national. He has been deported from Canada several times, but he always returns. He's currently in custody and awaiting deportation. Before they go to see Illis in jail, detectives decide to have a talk with his associate, Jim Thompson. Thompson is working as a bouncer at a downtown club. Police ask what he knows about Michael Illis and a head in a bucket. Thompson doesn't cooperate. All he says is he and Illis are friends. But the detectives think Thompson knows more than he's letting on. Susan Farland said she saw Thompson at the garage the day Illis took her there. The detectives now ask if Susan can recall anything else from that day. She remembers Thompson cleaning the seats of a van.
Police next learned that Thompson recently sold a van. It showed up in a sales lot in the Lower Mainland, and we were able to recover it from that sales lot. Police Constable Trevor Crocker is asked to perform a forensic analysis. They wanted me to do a full rundown on the vehicle, which was photographs, a fingerprint examination, and specifically uh, an investigation for the presence of blood inside the vehicle. My technique for the presence of blood is called a hemostix. The chemical strip is yellow, and if it turns green, it shows the indication of the presence of blood. Crocker finds traces of blood inside the van. Police now need to determine if it's the blood of the missing man, Vagar Cushman. Investigators know Cushman's home is in Calgary. If police there can find personal items which contain traces of his DNA, it could be compared with the blood from the van. Calgary police send a number of Cushman's personal belongings to Vancouver, including a weightlifting glove. Lab tests show that the skin cells found inside the glove match the DNA found in the van. Police now have proof that Vagar Cushman was in the van, but no proof that he's been murdered. Police are keeping an eye on Jim Thompson. When they wiretap his phone, they learn he is helping the detained Michael Illis run his drug operation from prison. Their basic method of operation was to take large quantities of marijuana down across the border and bring cocaine back across the border to sell it here in Canada. Police also place undercover cops close to other Illis associates. But in monitored conversations, no one mentions anything about a murder. Investigators decide to enlist Susan's help in a new plan to get to Michael Illis. They set up another wiretap between Susan and Illis's girlfriend, Leanne. Susan told her that she was upset by what it was that she had seen and that she was contemplating going to the police with that information. Illis's girlfriend told her not to do that and he said she would call her back. After Illis's girlfriend had the conversation with Susan, she immediately contacted the prison. The detectives are hoping that a frightened Leanne will talk to Michael Illis about the murder. But Leanne is one step ahead of them. She told him that they had to get married. It was obvious by his response that he was surprised by this. He basically heard from her that she would explain everything to him once the wedding happened and they could talk freely without the police listening. Leanne is clearly on to the police. But why insist that she and Illis get married? Detective Crook has a theory. The purpose would be that if she was his wife, then now she would not be compellable as a witness against him on a charge of first-degree murder. The wedding takes place two days later in the prison chapel. They were given the opportunity to uh, speak to each other after the ceremony. We wanted to listen to the conversation that they were going to have. And when there was very little conversation overheard in the wiretap, we were curious enough to see what was happening. And it was obvious at that point they had chosen that time together to consummate the marriage. But the newlyweds never mention murder. For police, time is running out. They need to find some physical evidence before Michael Illis leaves the country. The police aren't the only ones worried Illis will get away. Susan Farland has seen firsthand what he's capable of. She worries she may be next. Susan was aware of the fact that he had been deported a couple of times before and yet still had returned to the, to the country. So she was still concerned for the fact that although he was going to be kicked out again, he would come back and there would be some retribution for her. In that respect, we were under a time clock trying to put a case together for murder 
where we didn't have a body. Michael Illis is scheduled for deportation to Hungary in 10 days. His associate, Jim Thompson, isn't talking. Police have no body. If they can't come up with something soon, Illis could get away with murder. Vancouver detectives believe drug dealer Michael Illis has committed a brutal murder. But they don't have the evidence to prove it. And Illis is set to be deported in 10 days. To make sure he stays in Canada, police decide to charge him. He's now been charged with first-degree murder, and we are still trying to find the victim's body to support that charge. The detective's next move is to lean on Illis's associate, Jim Thompson. Either he agrees to cooperate with the police, or he risks an accessory to murder charge. We spent in excess of 10 hours with him here in the police station. He wasn't necessarily overwhelmed by the evidence that we had against him. The detectives feel they have no choice but to offer Thompson a get out of jail free card. We decided that we would propose a deal and it was as clear and simple as telling him, if you talk, you walk. In exchange for immunity, Thompson agrees to tell police everything he knows about what happened to Vagar Cushman. The associate told us that it was his intention to go to a movie with the victim. Illis decided that he would join them at the last minute. And they were down on the west end of Vancouver. As they pulled around the corner, the interior light of the vehicle was on. Illis asked the victim to turn it off. At the point that he reached to turn off the interior light of the vehicle, there were two shots fired. At that point, Illis used the lever the side of the seat to drop the victim down below the profile of the windshield. Thompson says Illis then ordered him to drive to the garage. The garage was quickly used to hide the van and the body until such time as Illis got control of the situation and what he was going to do with the body. Illis told Thompson to clean the van. Illis said he had his own work to do. Vagar Cushman was murdered. Thompson says that Vagar was new to the business. He was skimming drugs to support his own habit. When he shorted one particularly important client, it proved to be a fatal error in judgment. That group came to Illis and said, one of your guys has made a mistake in delivering drugs to us and given him the ultimatum of saying, either look after it or we'll look after your entire group. The severed head was Illis's way of proving the problem had been taken care of. The police finally know what happened to Vagar Cushman, but they need more than that to make their case against Michael Illis. Thompson says he didn't see the head or body again until a week later, when Illis insisted on his help. Illis wanted to bury the body parts and cover them with lime. He thought lime would help accelerate the body parts' decay. Thompson says he and Illis then drove north to a remote forest near Squamish. Thompson thinks he can remember the exact spot. The associate was able to take us to exactly the area that the head had been buried, 
and he was able to say it somewhere within this area that was about 50 by 150 feet. Once again, the detectives are running out of time. A judge in Vancouver is scheduled to review the evidence this afternoon. Without a body, there is no case. Thompson leads the detectives toward a small clearing. He stops and tells them he's sure this is the spot. We scraped after several times, one layer away, and a tuft of hair came up. In a shallow grave, the police finally find what they're looking for, the head of Vagar Cushman. It is almost perfectly preserved. If Michael Illis had wanted a speedy decay, lime was definitely not the way to go. It's a preservative. He put lime with the head in order to accelerate things. It's a mistake. Normally, it's lye that someone would use for that. Police can now corroborate Thompson's sworn statement. Michael Illis killed Vagar Cushman with two shots to the back of the head. Our case against Illis had improved 100%. Michael Illis believed strongly in the use of fear and intimidation, particularly against people he perceived as weak. He actually felt that if he showed Susan the head in the bucket, that she would feel that she was implicated in this murder and be less inclined to go to the police to tell the story. Illis just couldn't see someone like Susan Farland ever going up against him. But in the end, she was the first one who did. Eventually, Jim Thompson followed suit, providing police with the evidence they desperately needed. Both Susan Farland and Jim Thompson have started new lives in a witness protection program. Michael Illis is serving 25 years without parole for the crime of first-degree murder.